Okay, with Module 6, um, as you'll see from your title slide in your study guide, uh, we're covering microbiology. Now, many of you may be saying, well, why, why are we going to cover microbiology? Because I either have already taken a general microbiology course or I will be taking a, a microbiology course. Um, so why does it belong kind of here in a human physiology, human anatomy class? Well, that's pretty easy to understand um, from the standpoint of, Number one, we're going to talk about things that are kind of medically important to the discussion of microbiology. We're not going to get off on a whole bunch of discussions of a whole bunch of environmental um, type organisms and things of that nature. We're going to kind of focus on the human body. But if you think about the number of times that a healthcare practitioner is involved in the diagnosis and treatment of infectious disease and our understanding of, well, how are these diseases transmitted? And that's important for us to understand that if we're trying to decrease the likelihood of an endemic or an epidemic or a pandemic or any of those levels of which an organism can kind of take a disease process in a population, we have to understand it. We have to understand how it's transmitted. A lot of things that happen throughout history as we as we talk about the flu epidemic, as we talk about the plague and some of those types of things, well, a big part of why those diseases were able to expand across the globe as much as they were is the lack of understanding of how um, the organism involved or the microbe involved in those diseases. And so it's important that we understand that so that we can limit the infections that we get from our patients, but we also limit the infections we give to our patients. And that's something we commonly don't think about. People think about, well, I'm wearing gloves and I'm wearing a gown and I'm wearing a mask and I'm taking these universal precautions to protect myself. Well, you're also protecting your patient from you as we deal with individuals who, with, with the number of cancer patients we treat. Um, and the kind of the immunosuppression um, that's involved in that process as they're involved in the chemotherapy and the radiation and some of those types of situations, well, they're not necessarily prepared to fight disease um, at any greater level than they're already doing with their cancer. So it's, it's extremely important that we understand this. Um, and the better we get at fighting infectious diseases, obviously the less um, diseases we have to deal with. But it's always kind of a balance. We'll describe some of, some of those things here as we go along. So as we look at the study of microbiology, um, and the, probably the only tricky part of this is understanding an organism kind of versus a microbe, and it's kind of one of those thin lines that we, we cross. Because if we say that we're looking at the study of microscopic organisms, well, the only problem there is, well, what if this is something that is infectious, but it's not a living thing, okay? So it really isn't an organism because it's not living but it is something that can infect our body and cause a disease process. So that's kind of how we're going to divide that up. If we're saying that we are studying microorganisms, then underneath that we're saying we're going to study um, the pathogenesis, the pathogenicity, the invasiveness, the infectiveness of bacteria, or the various parasites, or the different types of fungi okay, causing, for example, superficial infections of the skin, like athlete's foot's a great example. Um, ringworm's an example. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but we can also have systemic or deep fungal infections as well. So we'll just, and we'll describe those. So because those are living and organisms, we can call those microorganisms. But then we get down into these two groups. One of them you've very likely heard of, okay, obviously the viruses, but also the prions, sometimes pronounced um, prion as well. Okay, either one can be correct. So because these are not living, because the, our prion is our infectious protein uh, and our virus is an infectious hunk of DNA or RNA, a hunk of nucleic acid that can incorporate itself into our cells and utilize our resources. So these are required to be, to proliferate or required to be intracellular. Well, because they're not living, um, by themselves, we really can't call them microorganisms, but because we do view them with various microscopic technologies, we can call them microbes. So microbiology is the study of microbes, and within that, we study microorganisms. So when we look at cells, and this was discussed back um, when we discussed cell biology in, in Module 4, and we said we can take these cells and we can put them into one of two groups, whether they be prokaryotes or whether they be eukaryotes. And we distinguish those. And we said our eukaryotes 
okay, having a true nucleus, specifically because there's nuclear material in both, but our true nucleus being that membrane-bound nucleus and also having membrane-bound organelles versus our prokaryotes having nuclear material but not having that membrane-bound nucleus. And our big discussion of that, okay, those are our bacteria that we'll be discussing. Um, and so that's the biggest part of our initial discussion. But we will talk about um, this kingdom protista and the, um, the parasites that are in there. We'll even um, talk about, of course, certain types of fungi that we'll be involved with. And we're not going to deal so much with plants, of course. So as we look at bacteria, our bacteria are prokaryotic organisms, and there's many classes. And we're going to talk about different ways that we kind of put them in groups, put them in classes. We put them based on their structure. We put them in classes based on their motility. We put them in classes based on their ability to produce different types of toxins. We put them in classes whether or not they grow in, they require um, an intracellular environment. We're also based on do they require an oxygen environment an oxygen poor environment or they can kind of function in both. There's a whole bunch of different ways we can look at these and again we have to understand how these bacterial organisms work if we're going to treat them appropriately and we have to understand how they work as compared to how we work because certain types of treatment methods we want them to decrease the growth of the bacteria or kill the bacteria but not kill us or not decrease um, our cellular growth. So all of those things come into play into the complexity of those infectious diseases. And so we'll look at them in, in a whole bunch of different ways. Now, just like we, we did when we covered the typical human cell, where we said, all right, if we were going to describe a typical generalized human cell, we talked about the cell membrane, we talked about the cytoplasm and mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. But all of the cells of our body that come from different tissue types and different organs, they're slightly different in terms of their structure because they're very different in terms of their function. In other words, some cells have more mitochondria and some less. Some have extensive um, endoplasmic reticulum and some not as much. Well, the same thing is true of bacteria. So as we show the general bacterial picture, do understand that we have variations of all of these as we look at the different classes and we look at their, their growth. So some bacterial organisms will have more of one, less of another. Um, some of them are modal, some of them are not. So we're, we're looking at the general um, prokaryotic cell. So if we look at that general cell, we're going to see a number of different things and we'll come back to this picture. So similar to our cells, the cell has cytoplasm, which is their semi-fluid stuff that fills their intracellular space, um, has similar to our cells, has a large amount of water as well as carbohydrates and lipids and enzymes because being living structures, living organisms, um, they have to have those um, components to be able to be functional. They also have ribosomes um, for the same purpose that um, eukaryotic organisms have ribosomes to bring it, um, to allow the function of protein synthesis. Because they don't have the quote-unquote true nucleus, they do have kind of a nuclear region. Okay? They have a one large chromosome um, that is continually divided. So different than human cells where we go through the mitotic process and we have an interphase, we have that S phase of interphase where we're replicating our DNA. Our bacterial organisms are constantly growing at a given rate. Now some of them faster, some of them slower, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. Um, because that contributes to how they cause disease as well. Um, but they have their, their large chromosome. Within the cytoplasm, they also have what we refer to as inclusion bodies. Now, these are basically large granules and vesicles, um, and it's just a way for them to store molecules that are essential to their function. So a way to store carbohydrates, a way to store lipids, um, those types of things. But we just collectively refer to them as, a, as inclusion bodies. Um, now, there is some variability, and we'll see that with our viruses as well, that some viruses have what we call an envelope and some do not. So we call them envelope viruses and non-envelope viruses. Well, with bacteria, some bacteria produce a polysaccharide capsule and some do not. So when we hear the term encapsulated bacteria, that means they produce that capsule. And the issue there is this is a, a polysaccharide layer around um, the cell that actually contributes to its ability to cause disease. Now, 
that term we use for that is called pathogenicity. So the ability for an organism to cause a disease is pathogenicity. So if we say that that organism is a very pathogenic organism, that means it's really good at causing disease, or that it is not a very pathogenic organism or has a low pathogenicity, then we may encounter that bacterium frequently, eh, but it doesn't frequently cause a problem or doesn't cause disease in us. So we're, we're going to bring that word back okay, here a little bit later. But kind of put it in context of the capsule, what happens is you can have a bacterium of a given type and have it be non-encapsulated. It's a pretty weak organism. But as soon as you surround it by that capsule, now all of a sudden your phagocytic cells that are going to dispose of that bacterium for you, all of a sudden things get a little tougher for their job. And so an encapsulated bacterium is more pathogenic than a non-encapsulated bacterium um, of, if it was, for example, the same bacterium if we were doing that comparison. Now, some of our bacterial organisms also have what are called plasmids. Now, what a plasmid is, is a segment of DNA that's outside of its chromosome. So the reason that's important is, it's by saying it's extra chromosomal, it's not within its chromosome, is it's still within the organism and it contains information. But being outside of its chromosomal DNA, it's not required specifically for that bacterium, but it can, can contain other factors and what we're going to find is it all co also can be shared with other bacterial organisms. It can be copied, replicated, and passed. And so it may have, and it's one of the um, processes by which bacteria can gain resistance to some of the drugs we're trying to use or we try to use um, to combat disease. And so how do, all of a sudden does this organism gain resistance to this an, uh, antimicrobial medication or antibiotic? Well, this explains why or how that can be the case. So a plasmid, extra chromosomal DNA not required for the growth and function of the cell, but can add additional information um, to how that cell functions. So if we look at our typical um, bacterial cell, um, again, I mentioned in this outer layer, if we start superficially, we have the capsule or the slime layer. That capsule is um, optional. In other words, not all bacterial organisms have it, but encapsulated bacteria do. Um, bacteria, the prokaryotic cells that they are, also have a cell wall. We're going to talk about the structure of that cell wall. It's one of the ways that we distinguish between different types of bacteria. Um, deep to the cell wall, it has a cell membrane very similar to our cell membranes, being a phospholipid bilayer. They contain within the cell membrane, they have a cytoplasm that contains ribosomes, that contains inclusion bodies, that contains the nuclear material or the chromosome, notice singular. Um, surface structures we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit about. We have surface structures like a flagellum that allows bacteria to be modal, and many of the types are modal. Also surface structures being a pilus or pili being plural, and these are going to help share information with other bacteria in some cases, but also um, contribute to its adherence um, to wherever this organism wants to cause the infection that it does. And that's an important piece to understand, is understanding that when it comes to diseases, why do we have respiratory diseases, and why do we have gastrointestinal diseases, and why do we have dermatological diseases, and why do we have central nervous system diseases? Well, two things come into play there. Number one, the type of bacteria and its, and, and, and we can include viruses in this as well, the microbe and its ability to colonize or replicate itself in a certain place of the body. And number two would be, well, how do we get it? In other words, when we, when we ingest something, then it's more likely it's going to be, of course, gastrointestinal. When we breathe it in, it's airborne. Well, it's going to be respiratory. When we have an open cut and it colonizes our skin. Okay, so all of those. So the avenue by which we get the disease, as well as its ability to colonize in a given place in the body. In other words, not all bacteria easily colonize every area of the body. Not all viruses easily replicate within every cell of the body, but there are specific cells that they gain entry to um, that they then do. Now, we talked about the cell wall, and it's one of the things that makes 
these cells, like plant cells and bacterial cells, different from human cells is we don't have a cell wall, but they do. Now that comes into play when we try and treat certain types of bacterial infections. In other words, what if you had an antibiotic, penicillin is one of them, that is a cell wall synthesis inhibitor. So its function is to inhibit the synthesis of a cell wall. If you don't have a cell wall, you really don't have an organism. You don't have an organism, you don't have a disease. Well, what's the advantage? We treat the disease. Um, what's the advantage to our cells? We don't have cell walls. So the reason it's not a problem for us is because we're not inhibiting the growth of our cells because we don't have cell walls, but we are inhibiting the growth of bacterial organism. Now, organism, bacterial organisms differ by the thickness of this cell wall. And that cell wall um, is made of basically a network of molecules, kind of a big, large polymer. Um, we call it a peptidoglycan layer. Now, that sounds kind of crazy, crazy term. But if you think about it, look at the term and say, OK, peptide, oh, I got amino acids all linked up, so I got protein in there, and glycan, okay, carbohydrate. So it's basically a protein carbohydrate layer that looks kind of like a chain link fence, um, but we actually evaluate the thickness of that layer as we determine the cell being, whether well, maybe you've heard these terms before, when we say that that organism is gram positive versus that organism is gram negative. So a test we do is called a gram stain. And in that gram stain, we stain with two stains. One is a purple stain, one is a red stain. You can appear kind of red or pink. If a, an organism has a big, thick cell wall, it retains that purple stain. It's gram positive. If it has a really thin cell wall, it doesn't gram negative. So that cell wall plays a big role in terms of us identifying, is this a gram positive, is this a gram negative? And you're like, well, why do we care? Well, it helps us narrow down what organism we're dealing with, therefore how we can best treat it. Now those surface structures we talked about, the flagella and the pili, obviously the flagella allowing motility of an organism, about half the bacteria that we deal with clinically um, are motil, um, possess um, flagella, so it helps with how the disease can spread. Um, the organisms also have surface structures called pili. Now, here we're talking about pili specific to a given function. It's called an F pilus or a fertility pilus. This is how an organism containing the, a plasmid can replicate that extra chromosomal DNA and share it with its friend. And so by doing so, you now had an organism that had the plasmid and shared, well, now this one has that information. So let's say that that plasmid contained information about resistance to a given antibiotic. Well, now this organism has that same information um, available to it. Also, the pili, the other pili, not the F pilus or fertility pilus, but the other pili, um, function in a role of attachment. That how does it gain attachment, for example, to the bladder wall to cause a bladder infection or cystitis? Um, a type of urinary tract infection, what's the pili um, that attach to those, um, to the normal tissue. So one of the things we do is we characterize bacteria based on their shape and their arrangement. We're going to go through that process as we talk about bacilli versus cocci versus spirochetes versus spirelia, um, those type versus the mycoplasms. All of those we can delineate by looking under the microscope, a light microscope, and we can look at their shape and we can look at also did they function or did they appear in pairs, um, did they appear in chains, did they appear in clusters. We look at those because that also gives us information about um, how to treat this patient. 